From global design practice Hassel, this is Hassel Talks. Welcome back. I'm Hannah Galloway. I'm a landscape architect in Hassel Perth Studio, and I'm your host this episode. I'm joined by Kat Rodwell. Kat's a First Nations consultant, cultural advisor and storyteller. And Kat is someone we at Hassel and many organizations turn to on projects to educate and guide us on our journey to knowledge. Where I am, I'd say Kaya, which is hello. I'd say Kat, welcome, uh, which is Wonju, and that's in Nunga language. Yuma, which is hello on Nanawal country, but I'm in Wadarang country. Thank you. So before we go any further and before we make any further introductions, which I can't wait to do, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge and respect the Noongar Wadjuk people and the Wadarang people as the original custodians of the land on where we are recording today and acknowledge their unique ability to care for country and their deep spiritual connection to it. We honour elders past, present and emerging whose knowledge and wisdom has and will ensure the continuation of cultures and traditional practices. Hi, Kat. How are you? And who are you? And can you tell us a little bit about you yourself? <laughs> you are. I love who are you. I don't know half the time who I am. I'm still learning who I am. I'm guided by ancestors of past and all the elders from past and elders today. I said I'm so lucky that I'm guided by them in everything I do, which is amazing. Um, where do I start? Well, proud Ngunnawal Bula, Ngunnawal woman. Uh, grew up on double country out in Laparuse, as everybody would say, swimming with anything and everything in the ocean. I'm a, I'm a water baby, absolute water baby and a shark fanatic, I should say. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us today. And it is lovely to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have an epic yarn, I call it. About this. And I always say, I always start off these by saying, let's get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that means me as well. And we walk this together. So the questions that we talk about, it means that let's be truthful, that, you know, raw truth telling. And this is what we're going to do today. Kat and myself uh, have worked together before. We went back in 2020, 2021, deep in the midst of COVID. So we've only ever spoken online. I've never actually met you in person because I'm over in Perth and you're over in Victoria. So if you could just explain to us a little bit, Kat, about what it is that you do. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, I suppose what I do is I act as a go-between or like the old-fashioned sieve. You put your flour in and, and sieve through everything, all the information so it comes out properly. I help to work with judicial owners, elders and community, work with projects and work with architects and design teams and, you know, other facets of that project to make sure that their voice is heard, that they have a seat at the table and not just the seat every now and then, that they're like project managers, that they have the ability to say, hey, we're not happy with that. Can you change this? What about this? So they're included in their own home, which is effectively what the projects that are on someone else's country are in their home. I also help the project teams and architects to be able to understand country, the culture, the protocols, to understand the history, cultural mitigation, but also take the team on a cultural journey. And when I say that, it's not death by PowerPoint. It's taking them on a journey where you can ask any question you want for fear of saying, oh, have I asked the wrong question? Oh, my gosh, is she going to be angry with me? I'm here to help. I'm here to bridge that to make sure that we all work together. We all walk alongside together so that the outcome is this beautiful storytelling through the building, through the structure, and that country has a voice loud and clear and that everyone hears it, sees it, smells it and can feel it. The other things I do is have a look at, um, as I said, my bush tucker bush medicine classes so you get to immerse in culture. And the other part I do is I fix the mistakes like a sweeper. I'm good at sweeping, <laughs> so people say. So helping people to understand that it's okay to make mistakes 
but work with us. Mm. Yes. To just introduce myself as well. So I am a landscape architect with Hassel. I've been working with Hassel now for, well, nearly, nearly 20 years. Gosh, is it that long? I have had the privilege of, during that time, working on sort of so many different projects in so many different sectors. And since moving uh, to the Perth office over the last 13 years, all of those have had wonderful uh, engagement processes with First Nations people. So they've ranged from St John of God's private and public and private hospital, uh, Perth's Optus Stadium, Bullabardet WA Museum, uh, Roburn District High School, which was a, a wonderful process and that's ongoing at the moment. And I've also lectured and and, and, and tutored modules with Curtin University in some of uh, the work that they've been doing with the Healing Centre for the Soul and Generation Mission uh, out at Wandering. So I, I personally have a deep respect for First Nations people and a huge interest in culture and the spiritual connection to the places that surround us. And that is where I kind of come from in regards to those really interesting discussions which leads me, I suppose, into what what the intent of today's chat is all about is, I think, for wider context to people all around the world who may be listening, I wanted to first touch on why it's so important to have these conversations and these discussions with First Nations people in Australia. As traditional owners, the cultural connection that you've had over thousands of years with place and the understanding of systems and and that spiritual connection to Australia itself I just feel as though it's so imperative and so important that any change to place or any further understanding of place is done in a discussion with First Nations people Uh, and that helps us as as landscape architects and architects and designers of of spaces for people to better understand the places and the systems and the and the spirituality and the and and the connections to be able to move forwards together in partnership uh, and 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 create better spaces for everyone what's your understanding of engagement Kat? For me we talk about the term listening and this is about engaging we need to listen and for us our mob, our people all around Australia and probably like every other culture is we listen not only with your ears but with our eyes, with what we see, with what we hear, with what we smell, with what we touch. That's how we hear. So it means that we are grounded with country because mother is our country. She looks after us. And we look after mother in turn. She nourishes us. We nourish mother. So we've got to listen to her with all those senses. So for me, engaging is using all those senses when we speak, when we talk to our traditional learners, when we listen to them, when we listen to our elders, because they are the caretakers of country. They're the ones that tell us the stories of the past and bring them to the present. They are the ones that share all the knowledge of the hundreds and thousands of years. They're the ones that show us how to live with mother, with country, how to learn from country, how to respect country so that we can coexist together. That's engaging. That's the short version. (laughs) <laughs> that's uh, that's so beautiful and so beautifully put and so it's a full sensory immersion in a way and and, and I love some, somebody once described it a, a traditional and only described it to me as an exchange of energy as well that that sort of that connection is is something that can be li- literally felt through a, an exchange of energy the more people that are in a place the more the energy can build up as well and the exchange of energy between the ground and the and, and the country itself sort of uh, resonates and builds up is that correct it's yeah. exactly so I'm thinking of oh what's the movie with the blue people avatar when I was watching avatar and how they were talking about they were all one with with everything they saw they were all connected mm. with that same energy that is the same with us and when I saw them you know how they you know they were saying that there's this energy that the ground, the trees, the animals, they all work 
in sync together. That's how we feel about country and the energy. And when I saw that movie, I went, oh, wow, bang on, bang on. That's what it's like, our connection to country, all those senses. And you're right, it's like being sometimes, you know, the more people we have, we have at our celebrations and properties, are like, you know, you rock on, you rock on, you know, you know you're rocking on and, and all this energy and builds and builds and builds because you're all sharing that time, that space, that moment with everyone and grounded on country. Once again, what you see, hear, smell, touch. And I and I suppose that if if, if we're understanding and I suppose taking the the example again from from Avatar, it's just expressing in 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 that way all of how natural systems are all in, interconnected and interwoven. And if we change one element so that as you know architects and developers and and the sort of sectors that we're in, we're you know, you're changing one aspect of it and it has such a, a detailed and knock-on effect to the balance of all of those systems. So again, it's 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 having these conversations to go on that journey together to understand impacts to all, I suppose. Yeah, one cannot exist without the other. That's why we say water for all of us is the giver of life. And it is for anyone, you know, without water we cannot survive. So that's just an example of it so yeah we anything we all exist we um famous uncle uncle um who's passed away was saying he's now in the dreaming and he, he always said the we don't own the land the land owns us nothing is older than the land and that that was that was how it was said it was beautifully said it is beautiful that's our said. connection the different cultural backgrounds are what makes these discussions so fascinating because, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a continuous absorption of learning. I think that what some people might find difficult is to connect to something that's very natural in the systems when they're stood in the middle of central business district. Do you know what I mean? So that you're surrounded with buildings, the systems are not visible to you, the connection is not obvious and literal. I imagine there's still a connection there for yourself and and and, and can you explain how you listen to country still in say for example that yeah a, this a city center. If we call it living culture. So it's living cultural heritage because it is seen everywhere, it is heard everywhere, we can touch it everywhere. Unlike, um, like, let's just say where you're from in your country, um, give me something that's, uh, what's one of your main big cultural features in your country? What is something everybody knows? You can go landscape features, but originally from the UK, you probably end up with somebody saying, you know, the Hazard of Parliament, Big Ben. Do you know what I mean? They'd probably be landmarks or Stonehenge or something like that. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. So places like that, our culture, we just touch the ground and, you know, we'll have artefacts come up, our middens, et cetera. You know, the landscape itself is part of our, is our culture. So having said that, we say our culture still oozes through the cement and the concrete and everything. It is still there because our connection is so strong, the spiritual connection. So another question, this is building it up to it. When you fly, you've been into Melbourne, I gather. Okay. When you're coming in on the airplane, I think I've asked you this question before. You're just about to fly into, you know, the airport. When you're looking down over Melbourne, what do you really see? But I mean, when you're that far up and that high up, yeah, you see, you see landscape, you see systems, you see, I see the tops of the hills, the valleys, the the and and where the difference between where country starts and city starts, and the details are are gone. Like for example, a landmark that I was describing is not visible from an aeroplane, but a larger kind of like uh, geographical region or whatever is Hmm. yeah because a lot of people will say i see buildings and not much greenery and we always use this and for me i see it differently it's like an inbuilt you know system within you know within us our connection to country that spiritual i see immediately i'll go to the waterways i'll immediately find 
a bit of green, so to speak. I see beyond below the concrete jungle, so to speak, because country is still speaking through it, speaking to us. Sky country, star country, the trees, the wind. So when I go into places where it's, you know, in Melbourne, for example, when you walk through, we, we call it the um, Pentridge Jail look, which is <laughs> the blue stone wall place, which is just, oh, it makes you feel enclosed. But we we'll always find that connection coming through it. So usually I get people to stand there and to close your eyes. And the first thing is, okay, everyone seems to be able to use ear, listening first. It's the first thing of connection. And we take that time to just stop because Melbourneites really don't stop. They just keep going. So we say stop, breathe, connect. So stop, breathe, connect to country, the first step. So, and we say, listen, what do you hear? And when they're really listening, it's amazing. Most will say, I can hear the wind. I can hear some of the wind, you know, you can hear it sometimes in the trees and the leaves. And we go, that's our ancestors talking to you, the wind and the leaves. Every now and then some go, oh, I can actually hear people walking. I go, that's good. Our ancestors are walking with you. And some will say, depending where we are, I can hear a bird or two, which is quite rare in the city, and they go, how good is that? Our ancestors are talking through the birds to you. And I go, okay, what else can, what can you see beyond the buildings? And some people say the trees and the movement of the trees swaying. I can see the sky, sky country. Doesn't matter where it's blue or black, you can see it. I can see the clouds at night. I can see the stars, star country. Or they'll see some birds fly over. Or sometimes they will see people laughing, people talking. That's the connections all coming through. They'll see the Birarang, the Yarra River. And I say, okay, what do you smell? And some people, you get someone's go, oh, all I can smell is the cars and that. And I go, okay, connect. What can you smell? And it's quite amusing because then people block out the car smells or, you know, and they start to think of some of the food smells. I go, okay, what else? And every now and then someone will go, I can actually smell some of the leaves coming through. It may not be the eucalyptus leaves because there's not many left in the city, but it's the smell of country. And it's okay if they say I smell different foods in that. That's the smell of country as well. Okay. Then we go walk around a bit and let's have a look. And when you find some of the trees and that, we, I get them to touch because that's our ancestors as well. And the trees are grounding. They're strong and their root system is strong and connects us to country. And with all the leaves and that, they can hear and the ancestors are talking and the birds are talking through it. And then all of a sudden the branches are there. We say, maybe our ancestors are there sitting there watching over you. And then they start to go, I'm starting to realise there's more depth to connecting to country, to what your spiritual connection is to country. It's not one dimension. It's many, many and that's why we say our connection is unique. It's on many levels. And when one is affected, it affects us deeply because we say it is our soul, it is our mother. So when mother is not well, we're not well. So that's how we start off with that, getting people to have a look at the area they're in, connecting with what is around them through the many senses. So it's more like paint by numbers. We're starting to layer the story, the narratives. But you need to know where you are first, so to speak. That's the start. That is so amazing. Thank you so much for that. I just feel as though I've been transported. <laughs> I was 
fully immersed in that and it was just beautiful uh so thank you I find that it is about reminding ourselves and just like we we all talk differently about well-being uh you know that is that is part of well-being as well just reminding ourselves to stop and everything is hurrying by and we see what's just in front of our noses the like you say the cars and the fumes and the buildings and the whatever and the people and the buses and the you know that's there it's obvious but if we stop for a moment and listen as you're saying I love your description of the layers and it is it's the subtle layers that are still there doesn't matter where you are yeah beautifully described thank you so much for that (laughs) I feel like I just feel a little bit more zen for that discussion there (laughs) <laughs> so I think that that's so important to uh, as, as one step of understanding place and connection to place. And as we we're describing, listening to place. And so I suppose now I just wanted to understand a little bit about how best to to listen to voices as well. So when I've gone to many different meetings and and over here, it's affectionately termed as Nunga time uh, because, you know, there are there yep. should be no time frame to a discussion uh, and that's, that's the beauty of it because it's a very a huge amount of respect that you give somebody if you if you dedicate uh time and enough time to have that conversation so that you're not driven by an agenda and i i i i'm, I'm here till this time and have to leave then and we yeah. need to discuss this 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 and this it's not about that it's about the connection isn't it it's about stopping and listening and immersing in that and that should not be driven by priorities other than that conversation and there are certain protocols aren't yeah. there when we start a discussion uh with elders and with traditional owners i wondered if you could just touch on us for uh, our listeners just to understand some of those protocols when we first walk into a room to uh, to uh, to start a yarn to start a discussion yeah I'd say first up I, I say to people know whose country you are on and for people who go you're in Australia yes the country for First Nations people we have many countries within Australia and we say that is, you could you could say it's like going into Europe and you've got many countries within Europe. That's like our mob here. Each country is different. Each country will have their own protocols, their own laws, L-O-R-E that is, um, their own what you call a flag. They could have a totem, not totem pole, um, their own ways of dealing and engaging, and that's important to know first. So whose country are you on? You've identified Nunga. I've identified what are wrong people. So to know the protocols is I always say we need to ask permission to walk on country, which is the old ways. In the olden days, you know, way back past, they would have sent someone forward and it's not necessarily you see a gate or anything like that going ring a doorbell or whatever. It's country. We sort of knew where the so-called boundaries were we would send a message and go across and it's different in each mob. So you'd go there and maybe um, have a smoke fire going and then you announce you're coming and you'd ask permission. Let's just say I'm coming from your country, your country, you know, Nunga country, to the elders, the traditional owners, and say why we want to. Because sometimes we need to come on country to discuss business, to trade, to arrange marriages. Not anymore, thank God. But uh, but to celebrate, to have celebrations. And it was a time where, you know, for example, giving a gum leaf, dipping it in water and sucking on it, was saying, I abide by your, your law, I come in peace and I will tread lightly on country. And by them saying, well, come on in, you're welcome then. Come and share all our resources. Let's do trade. Let's talk. Let's celebrate. And you then walk through country and you do that trade. So I still do that practice that, whether it be a phone call or email, announcing the intention of the project and the companies and the people asking permission to walk on country and a brief about what the project's about and where it is. 
So therefore, we're starting that respectful dialogue, respectful relationship. And they go, cool, that's great. From there, protocols would be you've got to remember a lot more people are starting to engage traditional owners, elders. So there's that overload. You call it cultural overload. So we need to give time. And you brought it up. We don't sit, we never used to sit back and go, oh, Rundry, why would our mother going to be here at uh, 12 o'clock by the sundial? I think by 12.10 they should be here. By 12.30 when the sun's almost a little bit changed, we're going to eat by this time and possibly skin a kangaroo by 1.05 according to the sun. So we don't do that. As I said, the idea is we come to yarn to talk. It may not be business. It's an announcement. It's just a talk. So we've got to give time. And I always say make sure minimum these days, four weeks. And most will have forms to fill out to say, you know, what the project's about, what we're looking at, um, why we need to have that consultation. And then they may say give a few times and dates and then they will come back to you usually and say, well, this suits us. So it's not about you telling us what time you want to meet. It's about you saying, "Is it a, could we meet? We would love to talk to you more. We want to know more about your culture this time, this place, when it's best for you. That's that reconciliation. That's that respectful dialogue happening. So even in the pre-meeting, I will usually meet with the team to give them an overall background of the area, of whose country it is just so you're a bit more aware of what to expect as well. And sometimes I'll give you a bit of language. So on the Werribee project we did, you know, we met with um, uh, Wadarong people, uh, Wadarong Traditional Owner Aboriginal Corporation, and we also uh, met at other projects and we always used a bit of language to start off with. So on Wadarong country, Nayora, which means sort of like a hello in Wadarong language. And that was respectful. The traditional owners love that. And then, you know, we might have said at the end, Nyetni Gobata, which is sort of mean, you know, thank you, go in peace, see you later. Simple things of using a bit of language when it's appropriate, use. We ask permission, whoever is there, do we call you auntie and uncle? Is it okay if we do? Ask permission first. I always say the term... I want you all to think about and keep in mind is two words and it's going to help you out a lot. Ask first. If you're not sure, ask. One of the other things I wanted to touch upon was the fact that walking into a room, mm -hmm. if there are First Nations people in the in the room that haven't necessarily met each other, mm -hmm. I think as uh, consultants, we need to remember that there is that process and that protocol we need to just step back for a minute and uh let the first nations people in the room talk about where they're from understand their family backgrounds am i correct in that understanding so that because when i've been in meetings and things it's sort of been my name such and such oh your surname is x you must be from this area i know your auntie and it's almost like they learn each other's family uh yeah. tree within the discussion to understand who each other are as part of that cultural protocol am i right in that understanding yeah it's like not one person makes decisions in the group it, it, it's a you know we a communal so there's many people that have that decision but some groups don't like to meet together in a meeting so we've got to be very wary is it appropriate to have various uh, i'm going to I, I call a mob because that's from what i was taught from mine in the same room together, is it more respectful to have separate meetings? And that's why I say ask first because some may feel uncomfortable and that's natural. So I usually, you know, when we come in, I will usually tell each mob who's going to be there. So it gives them the opportunity if they want to engage or if they don't want to. So when the time happens, yes, you're right, let them do that. But a lot of the times they may not want to talk about more family business where they're from. 
So we say don't presume they're going to tell you, you know, where they're from and everything like that. They may not want no, to. No, no. But you give them the option they want. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's something that I personally have never asked of anybody. It's just it's yeah. just sort of allowing, I suppose, if that happens through a natural conversation, mm. just stepping back and and and, and letting yeah. that sort of yeah. all occur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, many uncles and aunties, and as I said, they may not be what you term as by blood, but as I said, it's very a community, yeah. and that's the funny thing. We all walk in and go, I, yeah, I know you, I know you. I've walked over to Victoria and they go, I know you, Sinets. You Sinets are up in the Northern Territory and ACT, and they go, oh, my gosh, and I come to Victoria and there's Sinet Street everywhere, and I go, didn't know we were here. <laughs> so, yeah. When we're talking about people and understanding people and mediation within a space and reading the room and all of those things I think one thing that sometimes uh forefront in people's mind who do care they do care as a professional walking into this space as a designer an architect or whoever that we don't want to offend we don't want to say the wrong thing we are sometimes nervous and treading on eggshells as such that, you know, you say something as a cultural faux pas, you get something wrong. Should we be nervous or should we be conscious, but truth tell, I think that's a term we've used before, so that we can then learn from each other. We uh, And if it's an open and authentic conversation, we can help each other learn the better way through the conversation. Exactly. Look, we, as I said, when we came down and sat together, the reason why we talk about yarning circles, we're trying exactly 360 degrees and it's the thing of we're facing each other. There's no one behind our backs where the truth telling can come forward. That's how we want to sit with you by saying you, you won't know everything. We won't know everything. So we say don't walk on eggshells because you're holding back if you really want to learn something, ask. And if it is wrong the way you're putting it, then we will talk through it. We will tell you. But not go, no, nope, we're not talking to you anymore. You can't pronounce that right. That's not how it goes. When we on this learning journey together, we walk together, it means, yeah, raw truth telling. Ask those questions because it's the only way we're going to move forward. When we have our epic yarns or we have our code design side sessions you're brought into that conversation whereas in the past people keep you out of it you get here at third hand we bring you into that conversation where you're there with everyone that needs to be there where you are free in a safe culturally environment to ask those questions you mightn't get the answer you want but it's a culturally safe space because we set that scene. We invite you into the conversation. So please ask those questions and don't feel afraid to do so. When I do my Once Upon a Yarn series, I do them online because then people can type in their questions because they feel more comfortable doing that way. At the same time, if you are in a, a meeting, then you can probably give questions ahead of time as well if you feel that uncomfortable. So it preempts us, these are the questions we really want to know. So one thing I wanted to ask was by having these discussions and trying to promote uh, engagement, which is so important, is there a risk that we're not going to have, with the timelines of many projects, enough people to engage with do you know what I mean like people are becoming so stretched uh because we've got key elders and 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 key kind of uh traditional owners that uh are, are willing and, and 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 happy to have these conversations and I'm uh I'm the you know there's a concern that with everybody wanting to do it and we're all working and moving in the right direction and it's all 100% positive how are, how are we perceiving this working in the future when we've got, yeah, all of these projects going at the same time and everybody wanting to meet and talk and yarn and, and things? Are we going to get burnout from uh, a lot of people? Yeah. You already are. You're, it, it's overload. It's You've got to remember a lot of our younger ones are not stepping up to traditional ways anymore because of money. When I was speaking to mobs about this, I was giving them an idea of how we can try to 
to help them and what the companies can do to help to, to sort of speed things up but also to make sure to sort of lessen the cultural overload and cultural burnout. Yeah, and I, I think that part of asking that question is 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 understanding that when we have spoken with uh, different, whether it be Aboriginal uh, consultancy and engagement firms or whether it be just with elders or respected members, you know, it's all about having more and more and more conversations as in engagement earlier, continuing uh, the conversation, having many touch points throughout so that we're all on the journey together. But that's adding more load. That's adding more requirement for kind of having many, many more conversations. And yeah, there is just that concern of 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 of, of how we're going to manage that within regards to not getting burnout within the the cultural groups and 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 just having somebody from nine to five having to meet 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 meet. One hand, it's great to see a lot more um, projects and people engaging us to be part of the projects and to want to put cultural narratives and elements within them. But on the other hand, we're at three four percent of the population. It's hard because there's that cultural overload. A lot of our elders cannot cope with everyone's demands of time and everything. It means still engage where you can, be reasonable about the time frames, be reasonable about the requests, be reasonable about if you would like language, there are protocols that you have to go through about that. Does the language fit the project? A lot of us are saying, why are we just naming rooms and doors our language, it's disrespectful. It gives no reverence. Look at phrases. Um, and don't forget, boundaries sometimes change, which is what happened over here when we had the rap boundaries change. So sometimes that language does not belong in that country now. So, And the other thing is we were saying, well, what can we do? And this is from some traditional owner groups who are asking and were saying that perhaps can your company donate something? We're not talking about money. How about you or you have experts in IT, in admin, um, in accounting, etc. Can you donate 10 hours of your accounting time, of your IT time to these groups to help them out so all of that gets sorted and gives the elders more time to do these engagement processes? A lot of our elders who do this within Wretched Aboriginal Parties, Native Title Holders, is they, people tend to think, oh, they must be earning a fortune, and they're not. And that's the sad part. And the other part is you've got to remember uh, there's elders too that may not know all the knowledge you require. Stolen generation comes into it. You've got to remember it wasn't that long ago that you know, we were then allowed to speak our language. We were allowed to share our culture, our stories. So pre-colonisation, you know, we had 300 and something different languages and we passed down these stories and we shared all of this responsibility. Colonisation, we were being eradicated and that's the term, eradicated. So we weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't allowed to talk about our culture. We were put, taken away. We were not stolen. We were kidnapped and taken away from family, our culture, our comfort in to assimilate into the white culture. So a lot of our stories and language was lost. And some people tend to think when they go into these meetings, come on, you're Aboriginal, you're from here, you must know all these stories and that we need to know everything. And we say, please be respectful because they may not know that because what was taken from them. So, Kat, how are you coping? How are you coping uh, with uh, cultural overload and what gives you hope? For me, I am so lucky. I'm surrounded by elders and traditional owners from all around Australia where I do projects where it, it, when it gets really tough and very emotional and I hear stories of country and how hurtful they can be or I hear, we call them throwing spears at our back or we have people that 
just cannot get over that reconciliation bridge and I have to remain um, business-like but not show too much emotion where it does hurt because then I'm not speaking for community. I can go and talk to my elders, which is known as, and sit down with them to what you would call debrief, but I can sit down and have a yarn and that's me offloading by saying, you know, I, I really need to talk this through, this process. Am I doing the right thing? Am I still on that right path? Because, as I said, a lot of people call me a wandering auntie because I travel all over Australia and get privy to these stories, to connections, to some of these horrific stories. But I have to tell them because that's what they've asked me to do so. But I also have to offload them as well because keeping them inside too much means that I can't perform or do my role by speaking for community on behalf of, sorry, on behalf of not for community. Um, it's big and you'll probably find a lot of people in my role don't last. I mean, I've been doing it for a very, very long time. Um, many will come into it thinking, oh, it's just listening and doing this, and it's not because you've got to have thick skin because not everyone wants to hear that story. Not everyone wants to be part of a cultural journey, and that's okay. That's okay. And it's also exhausting for you, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely exhausting. Very. Yeah, people tend to think, one of the biggest things is people tend to think we do this for free and we don't because you may do a session but it's, or the prep beforehand or afterhand. Having a conversation or setting up an event can take something like 20 hours just back and forth with the elders or trainers to set it up. People don't see the behind the scenes. When I do my epic yarns, which I love, you know, performing, as you would see it, is, takes a lot out of you, but it's the knowledge how you want to engage the audience. It does. It's it's. It's a lot to take in energy-wise and the fact that people don't see your role as worthy of being paid and paid properly, which is quite heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, totally empathise with the fact that one of the hardest things to do, and I think as we grow professionally, I've found that, you know, you you learn your skills, etc. One of the hardest things to learn is people dealing with people and everybody is different everybody has different trigger points and like you say so learning to be able to be so empathetic in the position that you must must sit in to mediate at some points between all people in the room and ensure that uh, a process runs smoothly that cultural protocols are understood and adhered to that people are protected as well through processes uh and also, like you say, there, there's potentially aftermath of kind of discussions where you might have to then follow up and ensure everybody is OK. And, you know, like there's so much that must go on in your in in your brain when you're trying to read the room yeah. all the time. And then before and after that, we don't even kind of always. Yeah, it's not transparent. Yeah. You get to go home from your job. I'm in my skin 24 seven. And that's. That's the part people don't understand. And if I do something wrong within culture, that's my my role, my job gone because we, you know, Bush Telegraph spreads and that's that's pretty hard. So you've really got to be mentally, physically on the ball the whole time and it does get extremely tiring. But it's I love doing this and I know this is what – my ancestors have asked me to do so I love it and I've got you know Jeff works with me too so we bounce off each other it's like brother and sister role but um, just lucky and we've got lovely people like yourselves who want to learn and I feel very comforted by the fact that the hope is I'm seeing more and more people like yourselves and architects who are leading the way and wanting to participate wanting to do things the right way wanting to really engage not the tick box but do it for the right reasons and sometimes as I said the opposite is I see people in my role who are not in it for the right reason which is a shame but that balances it out sometimes I go that's okay 
because I know there's hope out there that there is more people going to come up. You just see so much of it more uh, occurring and so much more positivity around these discussions and people being passionate and willing to learn and, and, and wanting to be there and share and take the journey together. Yeah, and they're asking more questions. They feel like they can, which is amazing. Like I go onto a work site and it's really quite funny where it's one of the big bosses who's head of a project wants to meet with me every two weeks. We go have breakfast and have a yarn. I've never had that before in my life. That's the respect. And we have a great yarn. He wants to learn more. And then everyone will give me a hug and go, you're my cat or you're a cat. And they come up and give me a hug. And it's like, this gives me hope because they want to connect. They value what I can bring. They value the role, but they value the cultural input. That's fantastic. Yeah, that, that's 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 perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I want a hug when I go to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to interrupt this epic yarn because we're cutting the episode in half. As you can hear, Kat is an incredible talker and we just kept talking. And we really didn't want to cut too much out, so it's now going to be two episodes. The next episode, part two, we get to ask the questions that our listeners have sent in. You wanted to ask Kat about project timelines and logistics, what Indigenous or First Nations people want to see in their built environments, about the fetishization of culture, about balancing cultural heritage and contemporization, as well as questions on research, agriculture and planting. I really loved Kat's approach to these questions, her answers and insights, and I know that you will too. So check out part two on Hassle Talks. This episode was produced by Prue Vincent and myself in collaboration with Hassel's Cultural Engagement Working Group, with particular thanks to Rubina Cook, Kirsten Thompson, Adam Davis, and Liam Cridland for their time and guidance. <laughs>